morning, everyone. It is August 6th. This is the Broadwater County Commissioner's meeting. If you'd all please join us for it, a the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Elaine is unable to join us today, so I'm going to just call her, and uh, she's going to join us via speaker phone, if that's all right. Erica and Jim, this is uh, Franklin Salivka. He's our newest commissioner. Nice to meet you. And this is Ann Rouser. She's our clerk. Not our clerk. She's the county clerk who takes the minutes. <laughs> Hello, Elaine. This is Laura. Good. How are you doing? Yes. You ready? All right. I'm going to put you on speaker. You still there? I am. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We uh, generally take public comment at the beginning of our meetings, but because this is um, a Wednesday meeting, we do things a little bit differently. So we'll go ahead and take that at the end of the meeting and just jump right into it with you guys. Okay. And this is Erica Morris and Jim Moy. Anderson. Yeah, speak up. Okay. Anderson Zermillion, audit results, Sheriff's Department payments to volunteer reserve deputies decision. Um, so I'll just hand it over to you guys. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay, Elaine? I can. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Woy, and I'm the audit partner on this engagement that uh, we were working with the county since way back in March. Uh, March 4th of 2014 is when we first initially had a meeting to discuss uh, this engagement and try to come up with a with what would be a deliverable uh, to the citizens here in this county um, as to the effects on, on uh, the county's books regarding payments made to the reserve officers that were done not in compliance with state of Montana um, laws and regulations. So, so the question really wasn't, uh, you know, do you need some certification as to what what the dollar amounts were or, or, or anything other, you know, the history was pretty clear. What we thought was appropriate would be to come in and memorialize what were the dollars that were involved that were actually paid over a series of years from a date certain that we believed it was pretty clear that the state statutes said you don't pay volunteers for these types of services. Uh, to the reserve officers. It was pretty clear, at least from some training and some materials that had been distributed. So we wanted to memorialize the amount of dollars that were paid out over a series of years to these reserve off deputy, deputies. It wasn't like it was going to take a lot, of, a lot of work to do it. Your people had it done. Your people had those dollars identified. We, we were an independent group to be able to say, Yes, we agree. We independently came in and agreed to these dollars. So we came in, we looked at the dollars, and then we thought, let's try to understand what the people that were involved in these transactions, what they were thinking. Had they had training? Had they read materials to indicate that what they were doing was wrong? It was in violation of either county policy or it was in violation of state statute, whatever it may be. We didn't know what was in the head of these people. So we looked at everyone involved in the transactions and we went, we sat down to try to get a sense of what information they had available to them. And, and, and so this report, which is nothing more than a, a memorial of, of what we did and what we found to help you, the commissioners, kind of put this in perspective and then move forward. Because again, this isn't like it hasn't been going on for a large period of time, a long period of time. It's been going on for quite a while. But we took the time period based on information that we had that would indicate somebody should have known. Somebody should have known that these dollars were, were being paid out, not in accordance with know, county policy or state statute. That, does that make sense? It does. Yes. So, so we've issued our report, 
and it's an agreed upon procedures engagement, which means we agree to perform certain procedures to memorialize these, these transactions, to bring everybody up to speed as to what has happened, at least in this time period, and now allow you to go forward and do things hopefully corrected and compliance. So with that, I'll introduce uh, my partner, um, yeah, Erica, <laughs> took me a minute, Erica, <laughs> to uh, walk us through the report, walk us through the procedures and findings, and then we're here to answer questions. Okay. Is that so, all right? That's good to be. So I'm going to direct you down to the procedures and findings section of the report on page one. And you'll see the first thing we did is we obtained a list of all reserve deputies from the county payroll clerk for the time period of January 1st, 2009 through February 28, 2014. Um, using that list, then we obtained county payroll records to start to gather the information of how, what reserve deputies were paid and how much, and just to get totals for the year. Um, and just so you know, too, what we did not look at was any reserve deputies paid from BLM or Forest Service, because those are under a different category. So this is truly just paid out of the county reserve fund. How did you come up with the January 1 of 2009? How, let me just ask that question if, as I heard it. How did we come up with the date January 1, 2009? Yeah, as a start date. My recollection, and, and Erica or Laura, you can play <coughs> in, but I believe we were looking at a period in which there had been uh, some training up at the state of Montana regarding this very issue. And so we decided to go back to the first month of the year, of the year in which this training was, was what apparently had been performed. You know, there was documentation that that these type of payments to volunteers was 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 not in accordance with the state law, okay, or an interpretation right. of what volunteer really meant for that. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So then, after we um, obtained the payroll records, as I said, then we created Schedule A, which is the very last page, and we just summarized in total the payments for the time periods that are listed. Um, the first time period is from January 1st, 2009 through 6 30, 2009, and after that it's on a fiscal year. Um, just so you know, you can see it, it's not a large dollar amount that was paid. Um, but it, so for the first period, we noticed through payroll that the reserve deputies were paid $5,687. For the second period, which is fiscal year 2010, they were paid $7,272. And you'll notice too on here, all this, the amounts I'm reading are the amounts paid through payroll. We didn't see any amounts paid through outside payroll, but we weren't given that information to dig through it as much either. So just based on what we did, we looked at what was paid through payroll. Okay. Um, so in fiscal year 2011, it was $9,648. In fiscal year 2010, it was $7,698. In fiscal year 2013, it was $11,745. And then for fiscal year 2014, which is July 1st, 2013, through February 20th, 2014, um, was $11,162. And the reason we ended this on February 28th was because we started talking about it in March and we needed to pick a month end to have a good end date for a cutoff date for these procedures. So, so it, that, that's, is, was there a question, um, Elaine? Do you have a question? I think it's this just. This does not include BLM and Forest Service, isn't that correct? Yes. That's correct. And so th these dollars, um, and, and did we inquire, Erica, and I believe we did, that to the best of the accounting, accountant's position, there were no payments outside of payroll to these individuals? Did we, did we even do an inquiry on that? No, we did not. We did not. No. So um, I was wondering if we had done anything. Um, so then while we were doing that to get our summary, we used um, copies of time cards and the payroll summaries to be able to determine what payment was for what, um, for what positions, which ones were actually for reserve deputies. That way we didn't include any payments that were for people that may have been employees of the county and other areas. 
Um, and there are a couple things we noticed in the time cards when we were looking. We had um, one reserve deputy's time card was signed by a third party multiple times, but there was never not documentation of why it was signed by a third party. Um, if that makes sense. And we noticed others that were signed by a third party, but then would be initialed by who had actually signed it. And sometimes there's a little note that said, you know, maybe out of office or, you know. So most of them were documented. There was just one specific deputy that just weren't documented on that. And then we did notice, too, that these reserve deputies, well, because they were being paid through payroll, they were also accruing vacation and sick leave and being paid for those benefits during that time period. So those payments for the vacation and sick leave were, are included in the summary okay. that we used. Yeah. So we took everything that was paid to those employees regarding their reserve time. That's the they schedule. Yes, that's the schedule. What's that, Elaine? They can't approve vacation or sick leave, is that correct? That's our understanding. No, I think she said that the okay. schedule, the dollars include Yes, the dollars include, yes. Is that right, Elaine? Is that what you were yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So on that point, though, um, it's not appropriate for someone to sign someone else's time card, and that's uh, something that should be uh, addressed, I think, immediately, is that you should ensure that the person submitting the time card attests to that, to those hours, so. Always. Yeah, that's not appropriate. Uh, is Debbie up there to hear this? Uh, no, she isn't, but she's aware of it. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. That's okay. And so the last step we did is we decided to conduct interviews with employees and people that were involved in the process. Um, you can see here we talked to the sheriff, the under sheriff, the payroll clerk, and the finance manager were the four people we'd like to talk to in this. Um, so we conducted the interviews on May 12th. And the first person we talked to was Brenda Ludwig, the sheriff. Um, and she stated that she was not aware of the sheriff's department violating any county policies or state statute regarding paying reserve deputies. Um, she did attend training in 2010 regarding reserve deputies and payments, but she didn't feel that there was any new information. She didn't feel that there was anything from that training that concluded how you should pay the reserve deputies. Um, she was not aware of any county policies or state statutes that the department was violating by paying reserve deputies hourly wages and allowing them to accrue benefits. Um, and she did mention that all department payments were made from the county's reserve deputy budget line. And then the next person we talked to was Wim Meehan, the undersheriff. Um, he did not go to the training regarding the reserve deputies, but he felt that the practice of paying the reserve deputies hourly and allowing them to accrue benefits did violate st state statutes. Um, he noted they were violating the definition of volunteers um, by allowing reserve deputies to take home patrol cars. Um, and then all reserve de he did also note the payments to reserve deputies came from the budget line which is the reserve deputy budget line in the sheriff's department. And he believed that the department had recently corrected this issue by moving two of the reserve deputies to part-time deputies, which means they now are allowed to be paid hourly, and one to a part-time correction officer. So when we talked to him, he felt that this had been resolved because he no longer had reserve deputies. He had reclassified them, so he felt that it had been taken care of. Um, the third person we talked to was Debbie Kelly, the payroll clerk. And she's responsible for entering the time cards in the payroll system and reviewing the time cards to make sure they're properly approved and completed. She was not aware that there was a violation of county policy or state statute in how they were, were compensating reserve deputies. And she stated that if the county used reserve deputies now, they would only receive a stipend and did not be compensated as an employee. Now that she's been made aware of this issue. How do you decide a stipend? I'm sorry, say that again. How do you come up with a stipend? Um, a stipend is, was referred to, I believe, in, in a ruling at, at some point in the past regarding this issue. And the word stipend is, is simply a, a kind of a token payment, uh, not compensation. Um, you know, sometimes you will find in, with boards of directors that sometimes the, the board will receive a stipend. They don't call it you're being compensated by uh, by the hour or, or you know for, for attending these meetings. A stipend is, is probably not associated with, with compensation, but yet it's it's a token payment for for participation. And it could be and it shouldn't be at all equated to a to a fair value for that person's services. Okay. 
I mean, because because you know that's what compensation is supposed to pair value your your services. So you don't want to relate a stipend to to a compensation. Okay. So I think that's the distinction. Thank you. Okay, and then the last person, we did invite the previous finance manager to be interviewed and she declined and decided not to be not to participate. Um, so we just noted that on here. So it doesn't seem like from the surface that, that there's a lot, you know, of new information other than we believe that, that everyone clearly understands what needs to be done going forward and hopefully, you know, you won't find this situation. Well, we're willing to take any questions, we have commissioners. I think my first question: What does the uh, investigation cost? We have approximately. We we have not done a. a That's my goal accounting. today: is to we, give you a final. Yeah, my guess is 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 we've done one interim bill. What was the interim bill? Two thousand. Two thousand, and we have yet to bill do a final bill, which we will do at the end of this. We have an actual uh, rates. We have an hour hourly rates that we have put into the uh, engagement letter. It's on a per hour basis. Another question. You signed off on the 16th of July. How can we just find out about this yesterday? Well, we sent the drafts out and dated this to the 16th of July, and then we received the representation letter back so we could issue a final report on Monday. So this has been sent to the county on the, on the 16th then? Well, yeah, the draft was set. So you just hold it, I guess, all this time? No, I'm not holding it, no. We didn't come out until yesterday. The fifth. That was the final draft, yes. Yeah, we, we, uh, we preferred, we wanted to present the report, um, but we had to have, we had, you know, we had to have uh, the draft reviewed by the county, the people we originally were I never reviewed any draft. Yeah. No, you're, you're, we're presenting it to the county commissioners today. I, My you, office reviewed the draft. Yeah. I received it by email. But uh, apparently, I never was informed of it. I don't know if Elaine was or not, but I wasn't. It's all part of the process. Um, Dictatorship. There's. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Franklin? I have some more to go ahead and right. have a question. No, go right ahead. Um, I've been only interviewed four people on something this magnitude. Well, Commissioner Olbert started this office at first as an audit, then a fraud investigation, and all that, and then all of a sudden I see you interviewed four people. Three actually. Well we interviewed with the four we picked were the people that were involved in this process, actually doing well, the I payroll. Approving the time cards, approving the I think there's a lot of people involved there. There was a previous sheriff, there had been a, uh, a full rank of uh, reserve deputies. The only sheriff during this time, though, was Sheriff Ludwig. So um, even though this practice was years ago, the, the crux of it was there was a training that said this is not okay. At that point, anything done previously was what it was, but at that point, the process, the practice needed to end. I don't know if you folks know Greg News. He started off as a reserve deputy years ago. I think when he was a flathead, he ended up sheriff in Stillwater County. And uh, he's the one that really pushed this reserve program. He set up all these trainings. I, mm -hmm. I was a reserve deputy for years, mm -hmm. 25 years. And I attended these uh, uh, at the academy. The first ones were when the academy was in Bozeman. I went there. And, uh, Basically, I only talked to him once in the, the, the later years. Uh, it was a discretion of the sheriff how he wanted to handle that. And this idea here, I, I see on cars. That's the first time I heard anything about that. On um, like season? On the uh, have patrol cars. Yeah, that came up from the interviews. We didn't look at, like we got. That's been done that since way. in the early 90s. We always did that. I went myself probably in my tenure. I probably went through four different vehicles, put uh, about a hundred thousand on each vehicle. And they were at my place, just like the other deputies did. When they were called, who was there? I live in Tostin. 
time after time that there was calls. I would at wrecks or gunshots or disturbance or whatever. I would get there, try to stabilize everything until the deputies come. That, that's the way this has went for years. I don't believe that we did anything with the, the car issue well, other than just he just described, yeah. he, he put it in to his responses to us so we felt we would incorporate it in our finding in our report, but we didn't we didn't take the fair, the value of the vehicle and add it to their compensation. Yeah. Well, was, I don't, and we're not making a judgment. And when should know because his wife was a reserve deputy. I worked with her a lot. And I'll answer. I'll, I'm more happy to answer this. When this what what's being referred to was in, in 2008, uh, Cascade County had a wage issue come up with reserve deputies. And then the Department of Labor got involved. And that's where they said, okay, they're volunteers, they can't get paid. So that's where this training that the sheriff attended came down the pike. At that point, majority of the sheriffs across the state of Montana either had to cut the reserve forces in dramatic, or dramatic, or dramatically, because the fact is, is that the, the sheriff said you either have to be a volunteer or you have to be an employee. And, and Sheriff Dutton cut almost his entire reserve force in half because almost all his reserves were in detention. So you either had to be a detention officer or a reserve, but you couldn't be both. And that's where it came into play. When this discussion came up again this year and last year, I talked to the post director, Perry Johnson. I said, I need to know what the state law is. And there's a state statute that says that reserves can't have take-home cars because of that thing. They're a volunteer. And so that's where that statute came into play. It's, it, it, a lot of things, we've done things the same way for a long period of time, and I can I, I attest everything that Franklin is saying because we did. We utilized them as a, another tool. The problem is, is we've come into a society now where that can't happen, and that's where these discussions have come into play. The, the compensation, they, they say the part of labor standard is a 20% nominal fee of what a full-time deputy makes. Well, full-time deputy starts out at 1777, 1525 is not a nominal fee. That's a problem. When you get, when you have vacation and you have sick leave, you become an employee, you're no longer a volunteer. And when you become a, an employee, then you fall under the guidelines that the state has, administrative rules and state statute. They determine that if you're an employee, you have one year to attend a complete law enforcement basic. If you do not, you forfeit your position, your authority, and your powers. And you are no longer allowed to perform those duties. That is state statute. That's why we have this mucky mess that we're in right now, is because there are all these state statutes that no one paid attention to, and then just keep rooting their, their, their fester up and, and it becomes an issue. That's why we're here today in this same discussion. I know Franklin's right. My wife was reserved. He spent 26 years as a reserve. Donnie Kynette's been on the reserves for 24 years. Mike Wenzel's 21 years. But the problem is, is we can't keep doing the same thing over and over expecting a different result. And, and that's where it's come down to. So if that clears the mud in any form or fashion, I hope it did. But that's where this has all come from. I believe in 2008 it was. Somebody paraphrase what Wynn said. I could not hear um, he went into just the, the basic history, Elaine, that in 2008 there was a wage issue in Cascade County that led to Department of Labor uh, making a ruling that you could not pay reserve deputies as they are volunteers, which led to uh, Post conducting a training uh, to stop the, pr the practice and then the effect statewide. Um, and uh, Sheriff Dutton of Lewis and Clark County and the effect it had on his department because you couldn't have uh, reserve deputies and detention officers working. You couldn't have detention officers working as reserve deputies and there's state statute against reserve deputies taking home vehicles and basically even though it may have worked in the past we have to obey the law today uh, especially since it has been illuminated that that is the law. That, all right. Chairman Albert? Deputies are still get reserved deputies still yes. getting paid in uh, surrounding counties, uh, Jefferson County. I'm Martin. sorry, what was that? The reserve deputies are still getting paid in other counties, Jefferson County, they're still getting paid from what I understand. Are, are they receiving a stipend? Oh, I think it's just very, right. I don't know what they're getting, yeah. but they're getting paid. But it doesn't make it right. And, and this, what's the difference between the, it, the one this year with the, uh, you're talking about the retirement PERS, in, in the environment. There isn't a, a 
taxpayer in the country, in the county, that's going to uh, say anything about the retirement going to the firemen. No. Volunteers or ambulance or EMTs or volunteers, they get paid. Well, one of, the, one of the questions that came up to us is, why don't you check around and see what other counties are doing? And, and our answer is, we don't need to. We know the law. And the law is the law. And whether every county is violating it doesn't make the, it right. And I think, I think what we heard and I think what we're saying is, you need to go forward and do it right. And, there, and we don't care what other counties may be doing because I can attest to the fact that other counties have their issues. A lot of counties have issues across the state, and uh, you're doing it the right way from at this point. It's our understanding that there are no payments being made to reserve officers, and that they've all been reclassified to ensure that any payments being made are being made in accordance with state law. Back in 2008, I remember post, and so we had to dig up all our credentials. I had to go back, and I found all my trainings from, I guess it would be from 89. And, and brought everything up to date, and it was, um, I don't know, what, I guess the sheriff tariff it in the post or whatever, but, so that was all showed there, in, in, and I'm pretty sure that was in eight, 2008. Uh, Carla, Carla Bossi is our county attorney. Did you want to say something too? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, and something additional. Speak so, Can you hear me, Elaine? Not very well. Sorry, I'll yeah. speak as loud as I can. I just wanted to add, um, and Commissioner Slipka's comments, I'll just add additionally to what I had in mind to say. Again, as, um, is it Jim? Jim? As Jim stated, if there are other counties who are violating the law, that's their problem, and hopefully they'll fix it eventually. But what we have to be concerned with is our following the law. There are certainly, I am very well aware from experience, plenty of counties in Montana who have rectified this and are not violating the law. The law is very clear. Reserves can only be paid a nominal fee to cover expenses or costs. It's not ever intended to be a salary of any kind, and it can be in totality no more than 20% of what a regular reserve or regular deputy makes. So, you know, coming into compliance with the law is just because following the law is what we should be doing, and we can't be choosing the laws that suit us or our friends um, in one case and ignoring the laws that don't suit us or our friends in other cases. The other issue that's really important here is some of the reserve deputies that we had were in fact not um, statutorily compliant with the completing the uh, academy and all the requirements uh, within one year of starting higher. And what that essentially means from a prosecution perspective is any ticket that, that is issued by that not real deputy is challengeable because that deputy does not meet the statutory requirements to issue tickets. So I think the situation now where we have rectified by putting people into places where they can work with the qualifications that they have is appropriate and it really should not be a big argument. And I think, I guess I just want to say that I was supportive of this process. I don't believe at any point it was a fraud investigation. The well, I was it stated as such. It was stated right here at the meeting. Commissioner Olbert called it a fraud investigation. No, I never did. Oh, yeah. People, yes. everybody else right, yes. has heard that and seen it in the minutes. The Absolutely, right? All right, that's enough. The engagement <laughs> of this professional. I, I don't know, I wasn't at the meeting, if it's possible that, that Commissioner Obert said something about whether if there is some fraud that may, be, that may come to light in the course of a routine audit. But it was the engagement letter, which is public record, is very clear. It's an audit. The word fraud was never used. And... You know, trying to inflame passions and all of this, it's just more of the ridiculous, same old, same old politics that have been going on for a year and a half here. They're divisive, they're, just, they're hurting the community, they're hurting county employees, they're hurting our ability to do our jobs to the best of our training and dedication. And I just think it's all very sad that we have to have an argument here about following the accepted law that our elected representatives have passed on our behalf. That's all I have to say. Thank if you. I could just go back to the point of the, the type of executive report and that sort of thing one more time is, is that, that the word fraud consulting engagement was, 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 may have been an option at the very beginning. I know I, met, I, I brought it up in a meeting saying if we find any indicators, any, there's any heightened awareness coming our way, heightened risk factors that would indicate 
fraud, we would stop, we would come back to you, and then we would, we would move towards a, a fraud consulting engagement. But we believed, and as I said at the outset, that we were simply memorializing what most of you knew. You just had an independent party do it and basically underscore it so that your citizens can feel like they now know the totality of this for this time period and that there's a direction going forward. But I do know I brought up the, the fraud consulting option and recommended we, that we do not go that route initially, but rather go th this route, and if something were to be indicative of, of fraud, we would, we would go back to that approach. You talk about these meetings. Yeah. I never, you keep looking at, at Obert. Well, we you had never, a telephone I never meeting. saw you before, or no, talked to you until today. I believe, maybe, Laura, you can talk about how we, how we, we met with one of the commissioners who was a representative of the commissioners, is what I understand. Yes, chairman. And then we Just met me. with you. Or we met with you, and then we met with uh, who was the uh, yeah part of the county attorney, right? Yes. And so you were representing the commission, correct? And that was our understanding. Yeah. And then we presented an engagement letter that I believe was brought to the full commissioners, and they could have elected to go with A Z, or they could have elected to go with another outside consulting firm, CPA. And we were elected to go to they, you elected us to do this. To do this service. Were you were you on that commission? I remember that coming in. Okay, and, so I, that, and I was I voted against. It. Oh, you did? You didn't? You voted against A Z then doing this service. He voted uh, against, against anyone doing it. Oh, didn't, okay. Didn't, he didn't there, want it uncovered. I there see. was nothing to uncover. <clears throat> Everything there. I stated the facts already. I think you have a good idea what I've been talking about. Yeah. Well, if you I don't. You should have. But I I see. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Uh, a question I have is... Um, Brenda's got a question out there, it looks like. Franklin? Well, is she? Yeah, you interrupted and you're not the chairman. We're going to conduct this professionally. Um, Brenda, go right ahead. Um, did anybody from... She needs to speak up, I can't hear her. Did, did anybody from the current commission or A to Z contact uh, what was discussed in the training in 2010? Did, did you guys, do you want to answer that? Yeah, or? the only information we had on the training was a few some PowerPoints that we received from you. Um, I think when you guys, we went back and looked, we couldn't find a person that had done the training. Is that correct? No, it was, uh, I don't know if you guys were, were able to or not. Um, when uh, also spoke to this, I contacted Post as well, uh, the director of Post, and he's the one who sent that documentation as to what was discussed in that as well as a uh, three pages of notes um, and I did share those with you yes. guys. We also found in a file in the finance officer's desk mm -hmm. um, a PowerPoint from that training okay. and that uh, is kind of what started the questions and that was a result of another audit, uh, the annual county audit. Um, and that was uh, conducted by, it was sponsored by Post, conducted by Jim Nyes of Personnel Plus in Helena. And uh, he happened to be in the county shortly after that. And I asked him, I said, is there any way that anyone could misunderstand your training? And he said, no, it's very clear. This goes against state law, it goes against federal law. And that's when we started realizing things needed to stop. Uh, we did talk to the sheriff, things didn't seem to stop at that point, and that's when we all of you guys to, to help get us on the right track and, and put us on a, a paved road so that we had everything we ne needed to keep us in compliance. Mm -hmm. So in that PowerPoint, was there any discussion in the PowerPoint of the 2008 decision? What 2008 decision? That, From Cascade that, County? That, that Wynn's referring to. I don't know. I don't have it memorized. Um, I don't know if you guys do. What was the question? Brenda wants to know if a PowerPoint at a post training in which it was taught that it is uh, against Montana and federal law to pay volunteer reserve deputies, if there was a mention to a specific wage claim in Cascade County in 2008, and, and nobody is, is sure if it's there or not. I'm, I'm not sure it's relevant. Um, but uh, we don't have the, the PowerPoint with us. Okay. 
the Department of what is it, Department of Labor ruling? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that addressed in there at all? It, 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 I, I'm not sure. What 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 are you asking for? Was the Department of, of Labor addressed? ruling addressed during the training? I well, I do. We can't answer that without seeing the, the PowerPoint slides. But we we read the, the we read the ruling, and we provided the ruling to. Uh, Believe to each of the. Did we provide. We, I know we provided the ruling to someone, uh, to the finance manager. Did we not? No. Uh, or her representative. No, to the sheriff and her. I emailed it to the sheriff's attorney. Yeah, it was because somebody asked us for it. Yeah. And, yep. and so we sent we sent that. Out. But I agree. I don't know what the PowerPoint would, would help us here. Do you, do you know what? I've seen the PowerPoint. It, it seemed pretty clear to me. I did not attend the training to, um, you know, have any context other than that. But if do you have another specific question? Well, other than the training, didn't state as you're saying um, that it's illegal and that you shouldn't do it. Federally, they discussed the federal volunteer statute and the attorney general statute there, which said it was legal, and that you, if you work them, you've got to pay them. Did you guys happen to see anything that stated that this practice was legal in any way? Uh, what was the question? Brenda uh, stated that the training stated that the practice of paying volunteer reserve deputies is in fact legal, um, and that was in the PowerPoint. Um, I asked Jim and Erica if they had seen that, and they both said no. So you guys didn't see the Attorney General's opinion? I believe we, well, I, I guess you guys have to ask us the questions, right? We're not, right, we right. We we, did you see the Attorney General's opinion? Did we see it? Yes. yes. That was all stated in there, right? It, About it, the payment and all that. It, it, it's our position that the payments were not in accordance with the state law. So you're going against the Attorney General's opinion then? Franklin? Well, that's what I'm asking. No, the Attorney General's opinion, what Jim just said, is, is their understanding that that opinion supports the Department of Labor and Montana state law and the federal law that it is in fact illegal. Correct. Um, we also had uh, a variety of emails from uh, MACO, Chief Legal Counsel Mike Seistat, that was shared with you that also uh, made the same statements. Yes. That the practice was illegal. Anything else, Brenda? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I did have a, a question for you about the interviews. Sure. Um, I read both uh, the sheriffs and the under sheriffs, and uh, when we have a question about uh, state or federal law, and uh, you know, I think we can all agree that there's a reason we have so many attorneys, and that's because sometimes we need someone to decipher those laws for us. One of the things we do is we email uh, directly to the county attorney and legal counsel at MACO, and usually includes two. Uh, Mike Sesta, Chief Legal Counsel, and, and uh, Carol Knight, um, or one of the other attorneys there. Um, and then what we do is we ask them, this is the statute, this is my question, and they come back with a long, lengthy, detailed answer for us. Um, with, with the interview with Brenda, did she mention going to uh, anybody to clarify her understanding of this training, what it taught, versus the practice that was continued? Not that I recall. Um, as we noticed, though, she, she did mention she wasn't aware that it was violating state statutes. So no need to clarify, because she wasn't aware, right. she wasn't understanding. Right, she wasn't aware that it was a violation, she thought it was fine. Well, I, I want to interject another thing here real quick. <clears throat> Two things took place in, in that same time frame, and I was, I was part of one and, and not so much of the other. And one of that, after that decision out of Cascade County uh, with, with the Department of Labor, post, uh, who was a post director at the time, was Wayne Turnus, who's no longer there. Uh, he started two things. One was a reserve officer, uh, Dacum, to re, re, revise how reserve officers were dealt with. And, and part of that was because of fact as a statute, when it was designed, it is very clear in there that the reserve deputies are, are volunteers. And they are required to do an 88-hour training period within a two-year period of time. 
in the same basis is that they're not supposed to be one, they're not supposed to be right around by themselves. They're supposed to be under direct supervision of a sworn officer. That's what it says in the statute. Now, with that being said, we utilize reserves, and Franklin was one of them. We, we, I can tell you right now, I put that man on a corner with a rifle in his hand, I don't know how many times, in, in situations. Or had him come and back up somebody or go to some so many times in, in, in the past. Now, we are trying to re redo this because the fact is there's so many small agencies across the state of Montana uh, rely on reserve officers in, in, to basically supplement a full-time enforcement officer because we just don't have the money for it. And so they were trying to redo these to how it met the criteria because one of the things that Carla did bring up was the fact that when a reserve officer, if they don't have the criteria and the training and everything else that needs to be met, their tickets are very challengeable and they're being dismissed at a high rate across the state because defense counsel says they're not properly trained at the equal or better level of what a sworn officer is. And, and, and that's also a statute as well as that reserve has to have the same training in retrospect of what a full-time sworn officer is. So 88 hours for a reserve versus 480 for a sworn officer isn't comparable, it's not even compatible. So they were trying to redo that. And I, and I know part of that training that Brenda went to in 2009 was part of that. It was how do, how do we get this data and how do we get the criteria and the objective met on how to deal with reserve officers within the state to make it more compatible for small department needs. That never did really flourish into anything. The other part of that was the corner DACOM, in which I was part of when we rewrote the curriculum for detention or uh, corner basic, and, and that is now in practice. So the reserve issue, it, it, when it was dealt with, when it came up, Sheriff Dutton, I think uh, uh, even Sheriff Ca uh, Cashel out of Cap and Gallatin County, and I'm not sure. Uh, Sheriff Castle out of Cascade is no longer there. He's gone into retirement. And some of the other uh, sheriffs that were part of that whole situation really remedied a lot of their issues just by saying, look, if you're a full-time employee, you're done, uh, or, or you're going to be a reserve. And I, I think that's where kind of a lot of that went and that, a lot of that thrust and, and thunder behind redoing the reserve uh, component uh, kind of just kind of washed itself out and, and, and dissipated. And I think that's why we don't hear as much about it as we used to. So I, I, it's not, I, I don't want to, this isn't a, a finger pointing game. This is just a, look, we've been doing it wrong and it's, it's, we violated law and we need to fix it. And that's kind of where I'm at with it. I don't care what we did 10 years ago. I don't care what we did five years ago. Hell, I don't care what we did last year. We, we had a problem, we fixed it, we addressed it. And, and it might not be the most favorable, but it's the right thing to do. And, and that's where I'm at with it is, is, is we just, we had a situation, we fixed it. So. I don't want anybody to get in the, in the manner of pointing fingers of who did this or who did that. We were in the wrong, we fixed it, and, and, and we had, what I'm gathering out of this particular review of this audit is that it's just reaffirming what we already knew. So, uh, if that helps by any sense. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to indicate that when we did meet with uh, Sheriff Ludwig, what was interesting is she told told us that she felt that her and her staff were all understanding, all understood this to be okay. But then when we met with the under sheriff, it was pretty clear that the under sheriff had a different point of view. So there was a little bit of a, a difference of opinion. Because I know in our interview with Sheriff Ludwig, we asked specifically, was there any, was had you become aware of any, any uh, Buddy in the department who said, or the bookkeeper, did anyone in the county say to you what is happening here is not a, is not in accordance with the law? And she seemed pretty adamant that everybody was in agreement that there was nobody out there saying, "Hey, you know, we're we're not doing this right." But then our next interview with with the under sheriff kind of made it clear that he he believed it was not uh, correct. So so a little bit of a a disconnect from that perspective. As, as you try to understand a little bit about when we said the sheriff contact MAKO or other resources to try to find if, if what they were doing. It was her opinion that, that everyone was on the same page. Okay. It, so if you don't have a question, you won't necessarily yeah, pursue yeah, an I answer. I think that was, that was kind of what I was trying to say in a long, in a long answer. 
Okay, thank you. Brenda. And I, I did inform them at, at the meeting with them of an email. Speak up, I, please. I did inform them at the interview with them that I still have an email from John Flynn when he was our county attorney concerning the reserve budgets. So, as far as why would I think there's anything wrong with it when my uh, chief legal is telling me that it's okay? Say one thing. Wynn mentioned that 88 hours for reserves, and that's right. That's when the reserves start a program. The first thing you have to do is go through this 88 hours, but that's just a small part of it. The other riding with the full time deputies at the time, and these uh, that this great news that started with the academy. What those were, were and all these people that have been through the, the academy as, as full time uh, people, uh, they would take a, a week saying, say it was, uh, say it was riding tickets. The New Newman's Academy, it'd be a week long series. They'd condense it down into three days. We'd be there for three days, the reserves would. So we had the same thing condensed down. Well, and, and not to interject again, but you know, when, when the reserve component became, became part of state statute, the, the academy curriculum for full time law enforcement was three weeks. Uh, not to date you, I, I hate to date you, Franklin, but. Uh, it was it was a three week course. Uh, you went to Bozeman for three weeks, and and that and after your three weeks, you're a sworn officer. Have a nice day. And, and as time has gone on, the requirements for a full time peace officer, or public safety officer in the state of Montana changes. It continues to change. It, it's very fluent, and it continues to move. And we've always left the reserve component back in the rear with the gear, and has have never really done anything to get them to the same level. It's never been readdressed. They started the process in 2009. The same week that we did the corner stuff, it just never fulfilled in anything, and it just kind of dissipated out into the air. So, you know, what Franklin's saying is, is very true and very correct. It's it, they they compiled a lot, of, they compressed a lot of stuff from from the academy in, into short blocks of instructions to meet the needs of, of reserves coming in on weekends, and that's what it was. It was come in on a Friday night. You're going to be here Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and go home. And, and you're going to get the same stuff, just a really condensed, quick, fast, hurry version of it, um, so to meet that obligation. And, and I think that's correct, isn't that, Franklin? Yeah, and then, and that gives an idea that the reserves, when it was working with the full-time deputies, you know, hey, we we learned this part. What do you do in this situation? You know, because you was through you trained many reserves. Brenda, did you have another comment? When Lynn was talking about the reserve datum that they were trying to get going, um, they were also going to cover how we could get the reserves for their training. Because most reserves in most offices have full-time jobs. Uh, but like he said, it fizzled out. And nothing became of it. So I think the bottom line is, is there was a practice years ago. There were a couple of things that happened that precipitated changing that practice. Uh, there were some things done that fizzled, like the stay come. But the bottom line is, is it is illegal today to pay volunteer reserve deputies, and therefore uh, we can no longer do it. We're all on the same page now. We're going to no longer ever do it again. Um, and uh, the reason we did this was for one reason and one reason only, and it is not because we don't appreciate the work that our reserve deputies do or any other volunteers in this county. It's because it is our job as commissioners to make sure that Broadwater County is compliant with Montana state law, period. And when we find something that isn't in compliance with law, it is our responsibility to address it immediately and if we need to ask unbiased third parties to step in to help us to address that, then that is our responsibility. Because the bottom line is, is it's our job to make sure this county follows the law. So, do you guys have any final comments on this? I, I don't know that we need to keep going around in circles. I have one. Okay, Franklin? And the bottom line is, there's nothing wrong. And the bottom line is also, there was never any fraud in the reserve program. Is that a question or is that just a statement? It's a statement, yeah. Okay.
and if you guys have any final comments, um, you're free to make them. Um, otherwise, I do appreciate very much your time. I appreciate very much that uh, you've helped this county get on the right road, and um, we will be staying on that right road in the future. So, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, and then, like I said, I think, you know, we've been kind of beating this dead horse for the, the last uh, 10 minutes. I just uh, got a really quick, quick, quick statement, Madam Chair, if I may. Sure. Madam Chair, Tim Ravendahl, uh, there's been a lot of confusion here in the county whether, whether this uh, process started with an audit and or um, leading to a possible fraud investigation, and, and that was clearly a problem. It, it's, it's tainted our community with just the public perception of what the heck is going on. Uh, we have essentially gutted the reserve program at this point in time, and we have further eroded the public trust. Our lack of competent legal counsel has brought us into this day, and it is up to this commission to take the responsibility to act rather than continually seeking blame on someone else or pushing it off into the court. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Can you it to us? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. here in just a minute. Um, I, I am just going to uh, just piggyback on what Tim said. There has been quite a rumor mill in this community, and those rumors get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like the game telephone every time. It's totally gets bigger and more salacious. And yeah, I think uh, you're right. This rumor about this audit definitely was the product of the Broadwater County rumor mill. And I would hope that people who partake in that will start seeking the truth, seeking the facts. People who hear these outlandish tales need to seek the truth and seek the facts. And um, if we can do that, Broadwater County will get back to being the community that it can be and that I think we all have fallen in love with. So with that, Elaine, are you still on the phone? I'm still here. Um, I know you need to hit the road. We uh, have a very quick question from uh, Kim from Denning and Downey. She wants to know if we would like her to pursue a uh, fiscal uh, federal audit on uh, if you have a certain number of grants, a certain dollar amount of grants, then you have a federal audit. Um, she, we're close for uh, one year, it's a two-year audit, the second year we're not. Uh, do you have a few minutes to hear from Kim? Or do yeah. you, okay. And Anne, while I call Kim, would you let Virginia know that we're ready for her whenever she's ready for us? Certainly. All right, thanks. Virginia's just going to give us an update on the mosquitoes, too, this morning. Okay. So it's really hard to hear when and when Yes, and you know what I would suggest is maybe watch this on YouTube. Okay. And then you can get a full flavor of everything that happened. Okay. Hello, Kim. This is Laura. We're ready for you if this is a good time for you. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Is she in the building? She is. They are conducting a, um, the annual audit downstairs and helping uh, Debbie and Doug with the year-end closeout. Um, also, while we're waiting for Kim, this is a memo I proposed that the commission sent to the uh, department heads. And uh, after Kim, we can um, get the approval of the full commission. Would you like to come off for just a minute, Kim? <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. Um, and we have Elaine on the phone. She oh, can't hi, hear very well. Hi, Kim. Um, I just wanted to come and talk about the federal schedule. For, we have a two-year audit coming up, which will be fiscal year 13 and 14. 
Um, the first year, fiscal year 13, will meet the 500,000 of federal assistance. Second year does not. At this point, I don't have clarification whether we need to combine both years since we're combining the two audits or not. Um, if not, if we don't have to, then we really only need to do the single audit on the first fiscal year 13, um, which would, I guess then, if you wanted fiscal year 14, it would be up to you as to whether you want that audited or not. Um, what we would do if we combine the two is uh, combine the totals for both years and then determine which programs we're going to audit. Just briefly looking at it, I, I kind of estimate it would be uh, Forest Reserve and possibly a DES grant. That's one of the largest that's in there. Um, if not, 2013 may be the same programs, it may not. <laughs> um, it'll just depend on how much money is there. But I wanted to let you know about that just in case you want to make a decision. Yes, we want both years audited no matter what. Or we really, if we only need one audited, let's just do one federal program. So. Any questions on that? I do. Sure. What's, what's our advantage to a two year compared to one year? Well, we're doing a two year audit. We've already uh, went to a two year audit. Um, the advantage was that the point in time with the number of staff that had changed over and trying to get things um, up to date and people get their feet under them in their new positions, we moved the audit to a two year. Right, but what about the grant? Um, just to have both years audited if you so choose. That would be the only advantage if you were curious on anything. And you could actually um, indicate if you want a specific program audited. Any questions, Franklin? Yeah, I think so. Uh, especially these federal grants, I think we want to keep up on these audits. And uh, we don't want to end up with another deal we end up with flying. Exactly. And, uh, so I, I'm, I'm for it for, for yeah. both years. The federal government requires you to have it if you expend over five hundred thousand. So, yeah. We're at about four hundred thousand in that second year, so we're not quite tipping over that five hundred thousand, and we're just over for two thousand and thirteen. Because we still don't know where we're at on the spliner deal. Just combine them, no matter what the mm -hmm. determination is. Okay. Um, oh, it's and really, it's not like we're taking one year and auditing that and the next year auditing that. We're going to jam them together and say, okay, if you've got one program, we're going to audit that program. Um, you may have multiple grants in that program, we'll audit each one. <laughs> so That sounds fine. I think we want more eyes um, versus less. Right. Yeah. And I did get the schedule pretty much wrapped up. i got to pull some grant documents that I'm missing for 2014. But I may have to follow that up next week with the health department as they're on vacation. And, uh, and hopefully I can get into the sheriff this afternoon. Excellent. <laughs> okay. um, any other questions? Not for me. Wait, do you have any more questions? We kind of started on the audit, but we're also doing some consulting work at, the, at this time. So we've got one individual just working on audit. So hopefully we can move that process along a little quicker. I think everybody would be happy to know what the audit comes out with at the end of 2014. So. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. And if you have any questions or concerns, please feel, feel free to call me and let me know if you want something specifically looked at. Perfect. Right. Thank we'll you. We'll make sure we get it done. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you. And just so you guys know, every year the county uh, hires uh, somebody this year, Denny and Downey, and, and of course Denny and Downey in the past, to audit the county. Um, it's just smart business and it's also required by law. So, Virginia, hey, hi, come on up.
this is not on the agenda, but because mosquitoes are such an issue, this is an opportunity to hear from you guys, the experts on the ground, and also I have you available for any questions. We did announce on Monday that we could just be listening to you, but we can't make any decisions today. So, so that was more or less, yeah, just more as an informational type thing. Like that would come in. You know, there's been some question on wanting the map or looking at the map or something like that. So I thought I'd bring it over so you guys can see how the district is as far as boundaries and how it's spread out. So, um, basically, the orange boundary on here, the yellow drops down here, but um, the orange boundary is the boundary of the district that so comes up over on this side and then we come down and so it kind of comes along the lake with uh, Springville was an area that was annexed in years and years ago. Okay. So that's kind of why there's that big of dogs up there. Yeah. It's a big district. How far does it go to the south here? Shelley Lane. Oh. Basically where it goes to there. I can't hear very well. Oh, sorry Lane, I didn't know you are on the phone. <laughs> um, we're talking about the south end of the district, and basically runs down to Shelley Lane. And then this is uh, Flint Lane, or which is Lane here? Is that the other boundary? Um, no, it actually the district boundaries do not follow roads per se. So oh, okay. it's just a matter of the a legal description that was put in effect. Um, in the, like one example would be like Highway 12, or not Highway 12, Highway 284, when it turns off at the blinking light and heads north. I mean, the district is here, and then that first S curve, well, then 284 is up here. So Sand Hill Road, stuff like that, is not within the district. It's below that, just a strip close to the highway. So we don't so follow does, it. Does it not include Riley Road? It does. Okay. Yeah, it includes right there at the first S curve. It drops down towards the lake to Riley. But um, just after you make the bend of the first S curve, that's where the boundary basically cuts off. <laughs> they are, and it is a year that, I mean, I don't care who you talk to across the state, areas that have not had mosquitoes in the past or haven't really been an issue, are issues this year. Um, every district is having similar problems, and I mean, last year was nice, Mother Nature helped us, we had dry areas, the lake was low, we didn't have water setting back, and this year now the lake went full pool, plus went over, so then we had water submerging up out into areas um, or subbing into areas that we did not have last year. And so that's kind of why we're back to having mosquito problems come back and forth compared to last year's. We just, we had a dry year last year. And so we didn't have the amount of moisture or amount of standing water that produced breeding areas. Um, have you been able to do much aerial spray? We've been trying. Um, John Simple was out last night. Yeah, I saw the plane last night. He was out spraying last night. And I know he's tried before, but he says he gets down here and the wind is not conducive um, for his spraying at his altitude that he's at. So he's made three attempts, I know, and basically been shut down at the hotel last night. I think it was about the first night. Um, he tried, he got started one night, and then the wind came up, so it shut him down, so he basically had to head back. But I think last night he did have a full night in. It's my understanding there's five zones? Yes, we have five zones within the district, and that's basically to help us look at areas so when we're covering on a per night basis, try to get these different areas. Um, it's, you cannot cover the whole district in one night. There's just Not even close. Yeah, there's no way to do that. And so with the one truck, um, we have to hit the zones that we can, so we kind of prioritize areas or put them into areas that would be the most efficient to cover based upon the road system and what we have within those. And so we set it up into the five districts, um, just trying to help us also look at, okay, we, we hit this area one night, how are we going to approach the other areas or how are we going to make sure we, we try to get to those depending on weather and wind. Oh, we were just talking about that. Um, you were out. I was out Thursday or 
night in your area, in area four. Last week, and so we're probably going to try to run out and hit parts of that again tonight, um, and then as well as other portions of area one, area one which right. is basically like Highway 12 South. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know that it's just a black cloud around here. It's so thick. They are. Yep. And that's where they are everywhere. They mm -hmm. are. That's the problem. Is I mean, uh, you can hit one area, and mosquitoes, unless they're flying and active at that time, we're not going to kill them. And so, even with in a mosquito district, I mean, just being in a district doesn't mean we're going to be mosquito free. We try to knock down the numbers, um, but it's how you put it. They're mobile, so I mean, even if we spray like this 284 area one night um, and try to hit it as best we can based upon wind directions and you know what the whether it's an inversion or kind of what our air current is doing, we can hit that night. But they're going to fly in either from the lakeside or they might fly in. Um, from the south of town, it's hard telling. So I mean, sure the wind's blowing, it's going to push them a little. Uh, right. Well, it takes a two mile an hour wind to push them. So I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Two. But then we've had a lot stronger than Right. So I see. So that's the part. I mean, you hit areas, but you know, really, if you want to cover an area, yes, we we could try to do more if we had more resources as far as more equipment, mm -hmm. but. Um, I mean, the aerial applications we bring in, but aerial is expensive. And so you, you try to plan those and, and do what you can to have that supplement what we're doing. But I can't afford to do multiple aerial applications throughout the season. So How much money is in that budget right now, Virginia? Um, a current About. figure. Uh, let's see. It's, it's, we probably got about eighteen thousand left, maybe. I'd have to go back and because I just purchased chemical and with the aerial application and taking those off, I'm trying to remember like what they cost last for we didn't do aerial last year, but two years ago. Um, chemical costs have gone up a little bit. I know what I just ordered in. I've got about a ten thousand dollar bill, and not only basically covers about three weeks worth of chemical. If I remember right. Thank goodness. You alluded to this a second truck a couple of times. Can you share with everybody what that would do? Why would a second truck make any difference in fogging or spraying mosquitoes? Well, based upon like with the one truck, you can only hit. You know, certain area of each night. With a second truck, what we could do is you could send somebody out, a driver out one direction, and then you could send the other one out into a different zone or area within the district. So you could be hitting multiple areas, um, and then like the next night, instead of hitting one side, you could actually be hitting two areas as well. So you might be able to get a little better control over those adults because if you got two areas going, like say you hit both the north end, north sides up here. That's going to help maybe hit those that are flying across the lake area. Then the next night you come down and you hit town and south of town, try to hit those more. And then you could come back to where instead of it being three nights or four nights before we get back to an area, now it might only be two nights before we get back to an area. And that will help dramatically. Yeah. Oh. I was glad to hear that uh, this aerial applicator is uh, based in hell and lives in hell apparently mm -hmm. and is. Uh, he covers just a 90 mile, 100 mile radius from Helena, so uh, we should be able to have him just, you know, pretty good. I mean, that's good service to be that close to this area right. operator. But he also Come covers right. Cascade County's Mosquito District. He covers Three Forks. He covers Whitehall. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So it's not that we can just have him here on but the he's close. He's not one of these. way I understood before there was. Right. There's we, only the two in the state, really. Right. He's one, and yes, there's and one located three, more on the eastern side. The fortune to be that close to him. Right. No, that's for sure. And John's been around, I mean, like the district was first established. I'm stopped to think the 
numbers. There's a 1974 and a 1978. Um, one year was when they did a study based upon um, titer counts for encephalitis. And at that time with our population in the community, we had high titer counts, which basically meant more people were carrying encephalitis virus, but may not have shown the true clinical signs of it, of being sickness, but they were at those low doses. Essentially their body was fighting it off. Um, and that's kind of when all this started as far as establishing the Mosquito District. So it, it's had a history, and I mean, we've been doing with one truck basically since the, uh, I think they got that first truck in the 80s. The 80s, if I remember right. So we've been basically running that system ever since, um, trying to look at how we could bring in another truck. But the main thing is, is you don't want this equipment outside or you're going to be purchasing a new fogging unit more often than you should because the UV rays will break down um, the chemical tanks that are on it as well as just the tubing and everything else in there um, is very sensitive to sunlight and basically both heat and cold. And it's not just heat but also the winter time cold. So so can you repeat? Can you get slightly to know what you're getting? Um, we were, were down from the high level we were at. I think the last one, we were back down about 10, 15 per count, or per dip, I should say. That should be the 200. Yes, that is for sure. Which, same time, I mean, at that point, we knew that we had a, a large hatch, and then trying to get that, we had the larvicide side flowing on on the lake area. Um, same thing with some conditions, he couldn't get in the days he needed, so we were, it was later getting that on than what anticipated. But we are at the point where we knock down the larvae to a certain point where we still have larvae in the water, so we're still trying to work on getting those down. I mean, it, it takes some time. Most of the products you have are anywhere from a, a two week to a 30 day, um, and then it depends on your water conditions. If it's muddy water or how much the water is fluctuating in um, depth. So explain again for anyone who didn't uh, put together the dots you had laid out, why don't we just aerial spray on a weekly basis and not worry about you know the benefits a second truck would bring to your efforts? If you did aerial application, you maybe have money for three weeks of control of the season. So it's just so much more expensive. It is. And more reliant on wind, it sounds like. Yep. Um, I mean, because you look at where he's at, if he has wind conditions, and a prime example is, um, oh, what is that? Baldy View. Baldy View, the, right above the golf course. That ridge right there, for some reason, is like a mixing zone. You let wind come in one way, wind come in the other way, and it just starts swirling in there. Well, depending on how big that path, that swirl is, you might not get part of this whole area of flowing at all. Because there's no way to get to it. Okay. So, that makes sense. So that has been one thing that, like I said, when he was down, he said that hits that every time, and it's like going, your wind is swirling from so many different directions, it's, it's, it's hard to really spray, and so you can't do it, get a good spray powder yeah, in that area. When I'm driving the truck, I have to, I stop two or three times in that area, have to switch my truck the direction I'm spraying because the wind has shifted on me. Because otherwise I have spray going all the way in front of the truck and I don't want to be covered in spray either. So it's just, it's a tricky area out there because of that ridge, I guess, I don't know. But I just, um, I have to say, just, just so you guys know what my day or my evening is like when I do this, I might give you a better perspective. So when I go out there, we have a three hour window from 8.30 until 11.30 is what we're spraying now. Virginia can talk to you a little bit about why that, that's our particular window. But um, So I go out and I load my spray and I go out to these areas, okay? And the best spraying conditions are if I go five or six miles an hour in that truck. So as you can see by looking at these areas, and I know Elaine, you can't because you're not here, but these areas are huge. So, it, you know, I go as fast as I can, but I can't go too fast or the spray is ineffective. So I'm trying to cover all these areas 
the best way and as fast as I possibly can and, and whatever the need is, you know, based on the phone calls or what Virginia has seen in her traps and stuff. So, um, and again, if, if there's no wind, I can't spray. If it's over 12 miles an hour, I cannot spray either. And there were some nights, you know, two or three weeks ago where we just couldn't spray. And then we had some breakdowns too on the, on the sprayer truck, which we got taken care of. And just so the commissioners know that, you know, I took it out to Hans and they stopped hand to help us get that truck ready to go. So I just, just so you guys recognize that they did a great job for us. Um, um, and that cost us four or five days too, which put us a little behind. But I think, you know, I think we're getting a handle on it now. But it just, if we had another truck, we could hit these areas. And I think spraying one night and then going back into the area next to it the next night would really help a lot. Instead of, you know, because basically I can hit these areas once a week. And by the time I get back there, the mosquitoes are all back. You know, and there's, I don't know what else we can do to stop that without affecting other areas. So. I think that if we have to concentrate on one or two areas a lot, then we have to let the other areas go. And in people within the district, that's why I get the phone calls saying, you know, well, I'm paying my taxes, I'm paying in the district, how come you're not out here? Well, when you have public events and things that people come and say, well, you have to get this area sprayed and make sure we can enjoy the evening out because we have, like, say, slice of summer or we have the rodeo, the rodeo or other things going on. So you have to come back and make sure you're hitting a perimeter around that. Um, so then you have to let some of those other areas go that night or something and then try to get back to them. But it's, it does make it more difficult, like I said, with the one truck. Um, I mean, as people compare sometimes to Three Forks and they say, well, Three Forks is doing great. Three Forks has four trucks. Really? Oh, do they really? Wow. How, they, how does their district compare size-wise to ours, do you know? Um, it's similar. Well, um, they have they have all their trucks in a shed out on the airport. So again, they're taking care of the storage so that they maximize the life of their equipment right. and protect anyone who might want to vandalize with that chemical right. that could do some and the other serious ones damage. Is, you know, we look at other districts. The Three Forks district is is an interesting one because it's actually split. The river splits it to where you have the Three Forks district that's in Gallup County. That, that money goes to Gallatin County as far as that's how they work. We have the Three Forks District that's in the Broadwater County side. That's a small district. Um, they do contract with John Simple. They may get two applications for the entire season because that's all the money that that district brings in. And so, I mean, they do some with what they have and then their money runs out. And you guys are able to work the whole season because, of course, the mosquitoes don't go to bed in August. Right. If not usually till about September 15th, really, when the mosquito season basically ends. Um, and we are doing, we have what we, we set out what's called rotator traps. And we used to do just a trap, <coughs> would trap mosquitoes the whole night, and you'd catch 20 or 30,000 mosquitoes a night. We're still getting large counts, but what we're doing now is using the rotator traps. And so we set them based upon a time frame. And so we'll start them on the, and we have 12 settings within that we can do. No, not 12. Eight settings, actually, is what there is. And so we can set those for like two hour time frames, or two hours, one hour, kind of alternate around if we need to. And so that's what we were doing is trying to test to see when do we have the highest population of mosquitoes moving. And that's kind of why we used to go till like 1 in the morning. And I called Steve and said we need to rethink this and basically we need to start cleaning about 11.30. Because in our rotator traps, the highest population was between that 8 to 11 o'clock time frame. After 11 o'clock, there was a minimal amount of mosquitoes that were being trapped. So and that was, um, we have one trap on the edge of town and then another trap within the wildlife preserve. And so the town trap doesn't catch as many mosquitoes as the wildlife preserve area, but it's very similar pattern. And so if we're spraying after that 11.30 time frame, if the mosquitoes really aren't flying, 
we're wasting chemical and it's sure. just it's not being efficient. So we're trying to hit the big, you know, when most mosquitoes are out, same time as the products we use are very toxic to bees. So I cannot be spraying when the bees are still out, possibly, you know, returning to the hives. So I have to look at that as the 8.30 is kind of borderline, but that's, I mean, earlier in the year, uh, it's 9 o'clock before I had to start, but it's kind of, our time shifting a little bit, backing that up to 8.30. So that's kind of where we're restricted to, you know, when we can actually spray as far as doing what we call an adult site program, which means killing adult mosquitoes. Which is what the, the fogging spraying does. Yes. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Tim. Madam Chair, Tim Randall. Um, I would like to know, because we do have a real narrow window on fogging and or spraying, um, is there a reason that we don't have um, licensed applicators on somewhat calls to help out in these peak times um, rather than just depending on the one truck that we do have, at, at least in the interim until we uh, do come to a, a resolution on getting another truck? It all depends, I guess, on the season or the year. I mean, yes, we probably could. The hard part of it is managing the budget, do we you know, bring in more so we upfront hit it and then not have anything left for later part of the season, like in August? Usually middle August to September is usually when we have our Culex tarsalis population, which is the mosquito that will transmit the West Nile virus. Uh -huh. The ones early on here we've been trapping, most of them are called Aedes vaccines. Um, they are more of a floodwater mosquito they're not the ones that transmit a West Nile virus or encephalitis. So that's kind of where you look at, yes, we can take care of the nuisance mosquitoes up front, but when you come from a health perspective, the Culex tarsalis is the one that you really want to target and focus. And for us in the district here, they always hit the latter portion of the season. So you're using science to determine what your mosquito plan is for the summer. Sci uh, science and budget and personnel and equipment. Right, because okay. I do have people helping as far as um, our MSU entomologist, um, that's not his true title, he is a veterinary entomologist. He's the one who's been working on mosquitoes for a long time just because of the disease issues, not just in humans, but with animals. Um, he's the one who's been helping with the traps. We've had Carroll College actually helping as well in the past years. And so we've been building up this database of our trying to, I guess, build a district that's going to be functional as far as knowing what to do when. Um, I, early trapping or early monitoring didn't really indicate that we were going to have that big of a problem. I mean, we didn't have that many mosquitoes we were trapping. And so it's like, okay, it doesn't really warrant to us be out in a full-fledged thing because we're killing beneficial insects as well. So we kind of, the adult side is, yeah, when you come back to it, how do you hit these to make sure that you're hitting the adults? But the preventative side is getting the larvae side taken care of the larvae. But at the same time, our early days were only two or three larvae. We didn't have over a threshold of five where we normally put that at. So it's like, okay, you hit some areas and treat it, but it's not to the point that says five larvae or more says you need to treat this area. Under that says, well, you could do some treating, but it's really not warranted. Um, five is actually a, a very low conservative number. A lot of districts use a little higher number. We usually use about 10. Okay, so to do it when it's two or three, you're, you're now not being fiscally responsible because it's really not the, the time to do on that. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, Tim, another question? Just one quick follow-up question. Virginia, what is what is the fiscal annual budget of the <coughs> district? Um, let's see. I know it varies a little bit. It's most of the time, Tim, and I guess it depends on what you're classifying. The district brings in 
considering all revenues, VOR, et cetera, et cetera. VOR provides up to 8,000, and actually it's through Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is where that funding comes through. Um, the district itself, if I remember right, brings in about 16,000, and then um, the commissioners have helped um, provide funding to where in these bad years like this, we have that additional funding. So most time, we've asked for about 35,000, just looking at if we have that bad year so we have some extra money. But we rely on the district funding alone. Um, we don't have the extra funding. So that's where um, I look at it, is if we have to rely on district funding solely, we have very limited resources. Okay. Is that uh, going to be addressed, excuse me, Madam Chair, follow up. Is that going to be addressed in this year's uh, um, budget process uh, to possibly look at an increase in funding um, at the district level to accommodate the needs of the district? It certainly could be, it's up to the district. Well, I guess my question, if I may ask, is mm -hmm. can you clarify can, what you're talking about as far as additional funding or to address that? Are you talking about just having the county put in general fund dollars for the district, or? Well, uh, if we are looking at a taxable district um, that brings in, and you know, don't quote me on numbers, if we got in, say, $16,000 a year coming in on a budget, um, if that's not near enough, do we need to look at the citizens um, to increase that budget or uh, that taxable value, you know, getting the taxable revenue source um, to increase your budget in order to accommodate your needs? Or are we going to be looking at just a, a for example, using PILT to supplement your budget? Um, I guess that's the, the, the question is, is, as we look forward, how are we going to long-term um, look at the needs of the district? Sure. And that they know something is within the district, um, because mosquito districts have a cap on their mill levels that they can ask for. Okay. And basically, we're at that cap right now, okay. based upon what the state is put in it, or by state legislature. So, yeah, if we look at additional funding, we would have to go back and ask if, you know, can we go above and beyond that? There have been several attempts to move it from the cap it's at now of five mills um, up to 10 mills. And it's been basically denied at the state level every time it's been brought forward. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Madam Chair. Those questions, or those uh, requests always come from the boards. So, um, any other questions? Trudy. I have one comment, if I yes. hear it correctly, about increasing that budget. I think to increase that budget would put X number of dollars more on each household. Would you not have to have a public hearing? That is correct, Elaine. Trudy Southwick, <clears throat> understand that VOR also uh, dictates what and when you can do any treatments around that southern part of the lake. Um, would you talk about how they, I mean, because if they don't allow treatment, there's a breeding ground. Right. And no matter what kind of money we throw into the district and how much spraying you do all over it, you could be out there seven days a week and still not accommodate it based on their perfect environment they're living in. Could you talk about maybe your, uh, or their authorizations of what they have allowed this year and in the past, sure. and if it's even something that helps cut down the numbers? And it, there are things that we could definitely do out here. Um, in the past, BOR, working with BOR directly, um, we were, I think they would set funding aside in the tune of anywhere from twenty to 24000 Most of the time, it seemed like they kind of worked around that $20,000 figure. Well, when the management of this lower end transferred from BOR to FWP, um, without any communication or conversation with the Mosquito District Board, that funding was cut to 8,000. 
the money prior to what we used is um, products that we could use around in the BOR property to control the larvae that were there. And we could use products such as an altacid, which is a growth rate re regulator um, and it was longer lasting. Now with FWP, they've limited us to a product um, known by ETI. It's shorter lasting, I guess you could call it. Um, and you have to have the timing of it basically just right as far as when you put it on. Um, the Altacid was nice because we could go out. And even if water conditions weren't the best um, and we still had the larvae there, we could put it on. The Altacid would work over about a 30 day period. The BTI um, basically, depending on what's going on with the water, give anywhere from a seven day to about a 14 day time frame. We have some around. Um, I encourage people to put up bat houses to kind of help out. Um, I mean, bats will eat their weight or double their weight in mosquitoes. And so the more you can encourage that around, I mean, they will, they're one of the natural predators that can be fairly effective. Judy, just to follow up on with the FWP, now that they have cut that funding and have changed what you can use. Is this something you're going to be working with FWP to try to change, to let them know how is the board going to be We try to do something? And when did the FWP take over? I want to say it's 2007, about that time frame. Um, and that was based upon an MOU that was um, agreed upon between FWP representatives and the Board of Commissioners that signed it. And basically that stated what could be done. It was a 10 year MOU. So they said basically because of what's stated within that is we cannot change anything as far as our application practices or products we use. And so we're kind of stuck to that until 2017. And it sounds even in contact or communications we've had with them um, over the years about let's look at changing this, what can we do to get the wording ready to go? It doesn't sound like they're too interested in changing the practice. So they look at it from the aspect is they want as little product out there as possible um, because they don't want it to interfere with their bird population or any of their other um, aquatic vertebrates that are out there, put it that way. So I don't know how much we're going to get that changed once we can, that window opens up for us. And that was through the, our current, or our previous commissioners and the FWP? Yep. So it's possible maybe our current commission might could address that and maybe try to Discuss it. I mean, has that been something just from discussion from the mosquito board from you, or have you gotten the commissioners involved with trying to get their support and backing to try to? We've had do discussions um, with the OR um, because they're the ones that also work with FWP and kind of the funding for the mosquito control channels from the OR to FWP to us. Mm -hmm. So we've had the discussions with Paul Backlund and. Um, Sean Bryant when they've been here at meetings and it's just basically felt like we've hit a brick wall and so I don't know if that's something we could work on but that this MOU will come and we're the only district or only area in the state right now that is MOU through FWP everything else has now gone through contracts and so the contract system was what this um, financial gal at FWP said it's going to be totally different than what you guys are used to. And now we just make a, a phone call and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to the contract system. Now we'll have to go to bids. Now we have to go to a more extensive program to get mosquito control done. So I, I don't know if it's going to get any easier, but that would be something that I guess if 
the commission would be willing to help us in those discussions. I understand that we will also have a new district BOR person. Is that? Um, right. No, Bill Dyke, the one yeah. that was filled in. He is leaving or has already left. I'm oh, not sure. And Sean's leaving too. And Sean is a, a recreational, I'm not sure what his term was, but more on the recreation side too. Mm -hmm. um, yes, he's retiring. Yeah. And who's coming in? I have not heard anything yet, Elaine, on who is going to fill those positions. But yeah, we've had meetings multiple.